We're going to move right along. We've got, <coughs> now we've got the role of the nurses in Bataan, okay? Corregidor and the POW camps, honoring a Filipino nurse, okay? Adelaida Garcia Makabali. But first, I'd like to introduce Irene Heck, who was born in the Philippines and was nine years old when she was interned with her family at Santo Tomas University during World War II. Her experiences during the war made an indelible impression on her as she pursued her degrees in history from Radcliffe, University of Rochester, and University of Washington. She served in various academic positions, including Dean of the School of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Sangamon State University, President of Wells College in Aurora, New York, and Senior Associate at the American Council on Education. From 2004 to 2010, she served as Director of the American Council on Education Department Leadership Programs. Let's have a hand for Irene. <laughs> Next up, Catherine Siniza Choi is a professor and a former chair of the Department of Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. She is a core faculty member of the Center for Southeast Asia Studies and an affiliated faculty member of the Center for Race and Gender. She is the author of the award-winning book, Empire of Care, Nursing and Migration in Filipino-American History, which explored how and why the Philippines became the leading exporter of professional nurses to the United States. Her second book, Global Families, The History of Asian International Adoption in America, unearths the little known historical origins of Asian international adoption in the United States beginning with the post-World War II presence of the United, United States military in Asia. A hand for Captain Sinisa Choi. <laughs> Carlos Macabali is the second of four siblings born to Alejandro and Adelaida Garcia Macapagal. Macabali, excuse me, Macabali, not Macapagal, okay. My bad. He graduated from the University of the Philippines School of Medicine and migrated to the United States in 1975 to pursue his residency training in New York, Philadelphia, and California. He is a diplomat in internal medicine, pulmonary medicine, and critical care medicine, and has been in medical practice since 1985. He is currently the chief of staff elect at Beverly Hospital in Monte Montebello, California. Welcome, Dr. Carlos Macabali. Next up, we have Tina Macabali Jose, was inspired by her mother, Adelaida Garcia Macabali, a nurse on Bataan in Corregidor during World War II. She lives with her family in Alpharetta, Georgia, where she raised three children, including a daughter with autism. She is a strong advocate for autism and has helped autistic children and their families to learn about the condition and how to communicate effectively. Tina? All right, on with the presentation. All right, first, uh, thank you for the warm welcome you've given all of us. I want to be, sh what? Microphone. Is it on? Can you, if you speak into it. Okay. Is that working for you now? Yes. Okay. That's where we will begin. Okay. As you've seen on your program, our main focus is on the nurses from uh, Bataan and Corregidor. And believe me, I have some things to say about them. Uh, but I want to say first, I'm pr I am commenting from inside the camp. Inci in incidentally, that's the Philippine me, uh, well before Santa Tomas. And there are a few people in the room who will have mo known me then as Nunny Duckworth. Nunny was my Philippine name. Duckworth was my father's name and my mother's married name. I'm now Irene Hecht, which is a long way from there. Uh, anyway. Uh, Part of the survival for us in Santa Tomas was the phenomenal organization of our people, which I have always ascribed to the fact of our democratic roots and our ability to build community and get people to cooperate with each other. Uh, immediately we went into the camp, there were measures taken for health. Uh, the organizers got us uh, cholera um, shots very quickly. 
uh, for, I would say, maybe a year to a year and a half, we had a, a twice-weekly clinic where a Philippine doctor came in for about three hours a day, twice a week, and if you had small problems, of which I got many different infections because of the fact that unlike my outside supervised life, I was climbing trees and falling down and doing all sorts of things that uh, created infection. So I, I got to know the, pharmacy, the uh, Philippine doctor very well. Uh, but what I really want to focus on is the nurses, the army nurses, who really <laughs> created a medical environment that enhanced our survival. Uh, fortunately for us, rather than being rounded up as military personnel, uh, they were given, I guess, recognition from the fact that they were medical personnel and that they were women. They were brought to Santa Tomas. I can't tell you the exact time. I assume it was after the fall of Corregidor. Uh, and they became our medical staff. And I very well remember the day they arrived on, I will call it a yellow school bus. Yeah, I don't know that it was yellow, but it was a bus, uh, the kind that would pick up children to go to school. And what was extraordinary about it, because the camp had filled up gradually, I got in there with my mother the 4th of January, but people kept drifting in, you know, in little lots. Uh, and that was all disorganized, but on this occasion, the bus drew up, everybody got out in full uniform, lined themselves up, and it was clearly a military kind of an operation. They had somebody in charge. Well, happily for me personally, they were not housed together. Rather than empty a room and put them all together, they were scattered all over, and so two of the nurses lived two rooms down from where I resided with another 30 ladies, uh, and I got to know them very well. One was Eleanor Garin, who was a very special friend, and the other gal's name was Edith. But what they did for the camp was they instantly took over the infirmary that had been organized, and they ran it which meant that they operated on their military-type schedule of three eight-hour rotations each day, and uh, each group you know, would change from week to week, so you didn't always work the midnight to 8 a.m. shift. Uh, and it was very, very carefully and, as I say, militarily organized. The second thing they did, and I had uh, ample opportunity to test their system was they had no medicines. So what could they do for us? Well, you'd call it general TLC, but I will describe from my own perspective, I had the wonderful fortune, like many, 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 many of my colleagues locked up there, of having dysentery for at least 18 months. And if you know anything about that, it sort of comes and goes. There'll be periods where you, you're mobile and you're okay, and then there are times when you can't function. So there's, there's more than one occasion where I had to find my way to the infirmary, so I knew their system very well. And except for one occasion where I ended up on my hands and knees because I couldn't stand, I got myself in and I would walk into the ward. No problem no intake, no questions asked, no permission, no forms, no nothing. There's a bed, get in it. <laughs> and obviously the condition I would come in, I was at the desperation point, that was quite simple. They would put a white piece of rag on the end of the bed. What did that mean? It meant I was on a liquid diet, okay? Then they had another color for some solids, and then a third color, and I don't remember the ribbon colors, a third color, uh, which designated that you got sort of regular camp food. Well, uh, <laughs> that was their medical treatment. <laughs> there wasn't a drug to be found. But what did it do? Quite simply, and I'll use myself as the example, 
it saved me long trips to latrines and waiting in line. It saved me waiting in lines for food for two or three hours. It saved me walking around to find where I could do the laundry. All that sort of stuff. Uh, my food was brought to me. My only requirement is I had to go the 25 steps to get to the bathroom uh, and then get back in bed. That was my responsibility. But other than that, I was left alone. I could sleep as much as I want. I could rest, and what meals there were were brought to me. The only people who got to stay more than three days were those with dengue fever or malaria because they needed a little more time. But believe me, that made all the difference in the world in terms of our ability to recoup our physical strength. There's another layer that I do want to mention that is totally personal. Uh, in a situation like that, and I was a child from nine till 12 and a half, uh, you need adults to help you master things and cope with life. That's true, I think, for all people at all time. But it is especially important in a crisis situation of this sort where the pressures on parents are horrendous and they cannot lend you the kind of emotional support that they would do in normal circumstances. So you found other adults. And these two nurses, and especially uh, Eleanor Garand, became crucial to me and three of my particular friends. They taught us how to play cribbage. They taught us how to play gin rummy. They would spend their afternoons off with us. They would play Monopoly with us. And it gave us, as youngsters, a stability that cannot be overestimated. So that's my story of the nurses. But you have other people here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think Catherine is going to speak in a larger framework about nursing. So I'll leave it.